All right, uh, let's bring in our panel this afternoon. Graham Morris and Bruce Hawker, very good to see you both. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Let's just talk uh, US politics quickly before we uh, return to the domestic front. Uh, Bruce, you first. Uh, Donald Trump, he's uh, laying into the media uh, now for uh, not covering him properly or appropriately. Uh, of course, he has been saying a lot of things himself. It's his mouth that's getting him into trouble over the last uh, week or two or, or probably longer. Um, nonetheless, how do you see things at the moment? The polls are, uh, well, turning against him in light of some of these more controversial things he's had to say. Yeah, he really is suffering from foot-in-mouth disease, David, and that's nothing new, but when you start blaming uh, the media for your problems, I think you're in real strife. And that seems to be what the informed sort of thinking is in the States at the moment. The polls are bad for him. Uh, last count, he was between 7 and 8 per cent behind Hillary Clinton in key uh, battleground states and, uh, and was even struggling in, in places like uh, Arizona and Utah, states where he should win easily. So none of that's good for him. And I think it does come down to this whole idea that he is a very unstable, unsafe option uh, in a country whose president has his finger on the nuclear trigger. That started to come out the other day in Hillary Clinton's speech, and I think we're going to hear a lot more of it as time goes on. In fact, a senior strategist in the uh, camp over there suggested to me that we'd hear a lot more about his instability and the nuclear issue yeah, well, as time went on. Well, you can understand why they'd go down that path, I suppose, Graham. Uh, you read reports of senior Republicans and even some family members uh, are telling Donald Trump, you've got to stop saying you know, outrageous things, just focus back on the policy, try and look more presidential. But he, he can't seem to go three or four days without saying something that's um, sparking a new controversy. No, it, it, that's true, but nor do I think it counts. Look, un, un, unless Trump is starting in lane five and unless Hillary is on the parallel bars, nobody in America at the moment except the party people <laughs> give a damn, and the media. You know, but as we get, and, and they won't until October, and then and then you know things get really serious for the people who will decide the election, and those negative commercials, but particularly the presidential debates where it's Trump versus Hillary on the same platform, you know, it, 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 it she she could knock him off the stage. Conversely, he could come up with a killer line that blows Hillary out of the water. That's when it becomes fair income at the mo and and it shows you with the Olympic black coverage as to why our election probably should have been called last weekend or the weekend before. Yeah, maybe that's right. <laughs> Let's uh, turn to domestic politics. Bruce, we are out of the election campaign now, but you look at Bill Shorten, you get the sense he is still campaigning. He's, he's travelling around, he's doing forums, and he's, he's driving the one issue every day, even if it's not getting a run in the media now, every day. But banks, 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 Royal Commission, we need a Royal Commission. Um, what, how effective do you think this is? What do you reckon the thinking is at the moment strategically uh, for Labor and Bill Shorten? Well, I think it's good to, for Labor to be tying uh, Turnbull into defending the banks. I mean, everyone's got a bad bank story. We saw it last week when they didn't pass on interest rate cuts. It's a, it's a constant problem with, uh, the, with the banks and, uh, and the public. They just can't really tell their story particularly well at all. So I, I think that's why he's in that position. He doesn't really feel... Um, you know, there, there's no empathy for the banks in, in Australian... Uh, in the Australian community. It's just the reality. So um, I think that's really one of the reasons why they're pushing hard. And, of course, you know, there are really good reasons to be, you know, concerned about the banks and, and what happens behind closed doors and how do they make decisions about, uh, you know, what the, what the rates are going to be for bank cards and so forth. Uh, you know, they're big issues, big issues. Well, uh, Graham, I guess the government senses some vulnerability there. It's now announced... It wants the bank bosses to come before a House committee every year. It's not going to accept a Royal Commission on this, but how do you see uh, this issue? Is there a risk here for the government if, if Shorten keeps hammering this one? Well, he can he keep hammering, but there's nothing to do about it. You know, his mates in the Senate could pass some sort of a motion, let's have a Royal Commission, then it goes down to the House of Reps, and unless there's a few Judases in the coalition side, it just dies. Um, and, and, and you think at some stage he's going to get pinned. And that people are going to say, what would a Royal Commission do? Which corrupt action? Which people do you want to put in jail? You know, what is it that he wants a Royal Commission for? 
I don't think he's got a bloody clue. Well, he, it, it keeps he, he wrote it. He it? wrote it. He was doing a radio interview. He wrote a couple of things on the back of an envelope. Went and did the radio interview and said, "Hey, let's have a royal commission." He has no idea what a royal commission should do. Well, uh, I think they, they did during the campaign, in fairness, put out a few uh, more concrete ideas. But it keeps expanding now into interest rates, credit card interest rates, um, basically any gripe that people have with the bank uh, is, is caused. That's interesting. It's not a royal commission matter. No. no, no. Uh, now, the GST, uh, Graeme, you first on this one. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull opening up this debate about how it's carved up amongst the states. It's always going to make some of them, a lot of them, unhappy. Yeah, keep your head down. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I don't know why you'd reopen this. You know, the formula has worked. Even the Western Australians, not all that long ago, signed up to this formula. I think it was one of the courts, probably Richard Court. When they were benefiting from it. Um, um, and, and, look... It, in those days, Western Australia used to have it hand out, like South Australia and Tasmania. Then it went through a period where, you know, it was doing well thanks to all its dirt. But, look, if everyone takes a deep breath and waits until about 2019, 2020, two or three years' time, Western Australia will be back to normal. And then, you know, none of this stuff about changing the rules will apply and it's not going to happen anyway because the rest of the states will jump up and down. You can't... You can't Look, the formula has worked. Yes, some people are always unhappy, but, but look, over, over decades, it works. Yeah, and, Bruce, it's the mining boom that's created this situation uh, where WA now only gets 30% mm. back on the GST that its people pay. But it's, it's, it's a once-in-a-generation event, uh, if that, uh, where you're going to have that situation. Well, it probably is. And, and, of course, the other thing about the GST is that it can't be changed without the concurrence of the states. That means all the states. So the chances of that, uh, you know, are mine and Buckley's. There's no... None of the states are going to agree to any changes. So, in a sense, this is a folly that's being, uh, you know, inflicted on the Australian electorate, or, more importantly, the West Australian electorate. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, certainly not in time for the, uh, the upcoming Western Australian election and probably not the one after that either. Uh, it's the nature of the GST beast that it's a state tax and so the states are required to give their concurrence before the, uh, any changes can be made. So I, I just can't see this happening. I, I really can't. We've been talking a bit about China as well uh, this afternoon. Whether we need some clearer rules around foreign investment, particular assets, whether they can and can't be sold and what can and can't be bought and so on. Darren Chester amongst those saying, yeah, maybe we do need some clearer rules here. Graeme, what do, what do you think about this in light of the Osgrid decision last week? Well, look, our security people cannot disclose why they recommend to the government that certain things not be sold. They can't do it. You just can't have that sort of stuff in public. So we either stay where we are and you have the Treasurer making rules sometimes in, in, in secret, or... You come up with something that says, look, these, these things, power, water, defence, um, what's something else? Uh, communications. Communi telecommunications cables and... are, just, are just out of bounds mm. um, on security grounds or national interest grounds. Then they know the rules. But, um, but look, I... I and surely that should but, exist, but, shouldn't but, it? But, but even then... You know, we, we, are, we are in telecommunications. We are part of a, a group of five with the Poms and the, and the Yanks. Presumably they could buy it, but still China could not. So you still end up with that awkwardness. Mm, yeah. Well, um, I, I'd stay where I am. I tell you what, if, you, if you have a look at the, uh, the Attorney General's website, there is a thing called the Critical Infrastructure Program where uh, uh, private companies come together with the government. They talk about you know, assets they might own, like a power grid. Uh, and, and what is critical infrastructure that needs to be, you know, secured. Shortly out of that, Bruce, you could then draw up a list of these assets can't be sold to foreign hands, uh, be they Chinese or whoever. They, for whatever reasons, national security reasons, uh, must stay in public hands. Well, I think there'll be a lot of public support for that proposition, frankly. I mean, Australians get very nervous about the idea of their uh, public assets being sold. Uh, and when they're being sold to a foreign power, 
uh, then of course it becomes an even more complex and worrying issue. I mean, the other thing, of course, is the time it seems to take between when some of these uh, sales, uh, you know, are mooted and when they actually get a, an adverse ruling. I mean, the, the Ausgrid and Transgrid were on the block in New South Wales at the election back uh, about 18 months ago. It was something that the, uh, the, the Baird government went to the polls on, campaigned on, the opposition campaigned on. The opposition pointed out that there were real security issues associated with Transgrid uh, being sold because it actually controlled the uh, flow of electricity into Canberra, into ASIO, into the military, into Parliament House itself. But nothing happened for another 18 months. And in the meantime, all the money sort of notionally been spent uh, by the Baird government on all sorts of projects. I don't think it's at all tenable. They should be making these decisions earlier or, as you say, have a list of uh, the assets which are not for sale and just leave it at that. Yeah, well, I mean, you end up in this situation where obviously the Baird government's uh, upset about this and wondering where to turn now for a, a new buyer. Um, uh, China will be wondering why this has happened at the end of the process and not at the start of the process. But I'm sure this debate has a way to go. Mm. Bruce, Graham, we've got to wind it up. We'll catch up with you both next week. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. We will take a quick break and then back with the last word.